This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey y'all, it's Jillian McQuarter. I played Allison in After Midnight, amongst other movies. Right now, you are listening to the one and only Tommy Throwback Kovic on Splat from the Past. This dude knows everything, and he's a very good joke teller. Stay tuned. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now, I got a real treat for you today because this is the first interview I'm doing for Women in Horror Month. We will be talking to Tammy Heiler, who played Jan in the 1987 horror cult classic Slaughterhouse Rock, one of the most unique horror films I have ever seen. It's like Nightmare on Elm Street and Escape from Alcatraz combined. If you haven't seen it, check it out on YouTube. It's a great movie. Tammy uh, was was um, in that movie. She was in Pretty Smart, which was um, Patricia Arquette's um, first movie, I think, before Dream uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, ironically. Uh, she was in Cloak and Dagger. Um, she's a singer. She contributed songs to uh, Runaway Bride and um, Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen. And um, she's also got her own production company, Smashville Entertainment. And we're going to talk about all that stuff today. And it's going to be extraordinary. I can't wait. This is an awesome month. February is such an awesome month with all these different eclectic types of guests. It's going to be absolutely tubular. I've never used that word before. I'm always using magnificent, extraordinary, superb, all those, but tubular I want to try for today. So yeah, here is my interview with Tammy Heiler. Hey, Tammy, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. How are you, Tommy? I am really good, really good. This is uh, such a great. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm just happy as a fish. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, going back in time, uh, was music the first thing you gravitated toward as far as the arts is concerned? Um, <laughs> you. If you asked my mother, um, she would tell you that. Um, at I think five or six years old, I would put my ear up to the record player, the phonograph, mm -hmm. you know, the old fashioned stereo we had, and I would <laughs> listen to Mozart records because I just loved, I guess, the sound of the classical music, um, yeah. which is very strange because I grew up in Arizona and on um, country music, and <laughs> <laughs> it's just, but I, I love all kinds of music, and so yeah, I guess it was music at first, and then shortly after, um, she would continue the story to say, I pointed at the TV one night, um, when I was probably about seven or eight, maybe six, maybe seven, and said, <laughs> she tells this to everybody, I don't remember it, but she said, she said, I turned around and I pointed at the TV and I said, Mama, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, all of that encompassed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how, who were your uh, musical idols growing up? Growing up, well, it, it's, you know, growing up in Arizona, it's sort of like, it's not, you know, not like I grew up in the South, country music, like good old country girl, country boy from the South. I grew up in, you know, the West. So mm -hmm. it was um, a lot of, like, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, um, you know, the, Merle Haggard, um, but also the Eagles and John oh. Denver. And my first record I, brought, I actually bought myself was um, John Denver, Rocky Mountain High, and that was my first favorite song. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> kind of like, and then, you know, I loved female artists like Emmy Lou and um, Linda Ronstadt. She was kind of considered country-ish back then, country yeah. pop, and, you know, and Crystal Gale and people like that. So, But my musical tastes have always been really, really wide, but for the most part, growing up in Arizona, I was, I was definitely um, led more on the countryside, and my mom was bringing me up with... 
Um, she was actually friends with Waylon, um, um, Waylon's... Waylon Jennings? Yeah, with Waylon's wife, Jessie, and her two sisters. They, they all were from Mesa, Arizona, so that's where I grew up. And so, some, you know, my mom used to go, and my dad used to go see them play when they were, you know, struggling artists at... Um, I think it was called Sun Devil Lounge, maybe, back, way back then, in, the, the, in the river bottom in Scottsdale. Oh, yeah, Sun, and, Sun, um, Sun Devil yeah. Stadium. <laughs> yep, so they, she, you know, they were big fans of Waylon when he was just struggling getting a start. And then, um, and then, you know, as things would have it, they sort of got to know each other. And my uncle, he's not my real uncle, but he's, been, uh, we've called him Uncle Lou for my whole life. Mm-hmm. He was Waylon's opening band. Him and his brother, they were called the Hawkins Brothers. So we would, we you know, would go see our friends and met Waylon through that whole thing. And at one point or another, there was um, times. I have a picture of it in my house where um, the Hawkins Brothers and Waylon were in our living room. I mean, I grew up watching these guys sing in my living room and Waylon was there one night. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Do you remember yeah. your, do you remember your first concert? Oh man. Yeah, probably. Well, if you call it a concert, <laughs> but in high school, I, um, I learned to play the guitar in junior high school because I just thought it would be really super romantic to know how to play the guitar and sing to people. <laughs> <laughs> but I joined with, a good friend of mine, Lisa Bolden, and we became a duo, a duo in high school, and we started getting booked around, you know, Tempe and Mesa and Scottsdale, and we just we just did a really cool handful of songs for people and performed for people whenever we could, and I I think maybe one of the first ones was I can't remember the name of the bar. It was there in Tempe. It was a college bar. Um, can't remember the name of it right off. It'll come to me soon. But, yeah, just kind of sneaking into places when you're not really old enough to play, but they'll let you play music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I started out going to concerts at the county fair in the, the Bay Area where I'm from. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, county fair is perfect. That's a went to many concerts at the fair. <laughs> yeah. <they're> still, <laughs> it's still going on, too. They're, it's amazing how they're able to get such high-profile bands to play there, you know? It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Oh, you mean, you know, my first concert that I went to, this is even this is even outside the realm. Again, my music tastes are really wide. Yeah. My very first concert that I ever went to was the Carpenters at Grady Gamage in Phoenix. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, I've seen everyone... Um, at the fair, I saw Cheap Trick, Grand Funk Railroad, Steppenwolf, uh, Night Ranger twice, uh, nice. Fo- Fog Hat. I've seen I've seen a lot of people. <laughs> That's awesome. Music is the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> it, it is. It is. I just wish I could play it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't play it that's good because we need people to listen to us playing it <laughs> yeah <laughs> did, did you, so did you have any interest in acting growing up yeah that's i think that's what i meant when i pointed at the tv is that that's oh, yeah. what mom said is that i just wanted to you know play i guess you know when you're a little kid and you see that it's kind of like well i want to I want to do that. I want to pretend and make up stories on 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 TV, <laughs> and that's what I'm still doing. <laughs> so yeah, I started. I um, actually kind of, uh, if you could call it, like a a little kind of discovered moment in my mo- in my you know life when when I was in high school and uh, I think I might have been a sophomore. And at the end of the year, you go to somewhere fun everybody gets on a bus and goes to a park or something yeah. we ended up going to this place that was um called big surf where it was in in tempe but it made waves right it's a wave park with a sand yeah you know sand lagoon and everything so we were all in the parking lot and our buses and everybody was unloaded and all these high school kids or you know hundreds of kids in the parking lot and somebody had a football and we were throwing a football around and we were all waiting to go in, and what we were waiting for was there was a commercial being filmed at Big Surf, and the crew came out, and I was with all my friends, and, and I certainly uh, wasn't the prettiest girl in school. I was not the, you know, the most 
the most popular group, but I could throw a football. <laughs> so they um, came up to me out of hundreds of kids and said, hey, do you want to be in a Chevy commercial? And I was kind of like, well, yeah. <laughs> what took you so long? So um, literally, I went home that night, and they gave me their card, and my mom and dad called them, and, and I did my first um, major commercial. It was Chevy truck, and I ended up, they asked me on the spot, do you do you by any chance ride horses? And I've grown up on a horse my whole life. So yeah. um, I ended up, you know, being a girl that rode horses through a through a pasture and splashed through a creek with a Chevy truck. And I was, I think I was 14. And so sort of um, got the bug right then. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I lived in Glendale, Arizona for three months back in 2007, and I, I got out of there quick. <laughs> <laughs> Glendale, yeah, back in 2007. Well, it's grown a lot since I left. I mean, I left in 1981, so that's a long time ago. But it's hot in the summer. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's way too hot. I don't mind uh, visiting there to see my cousins, but living there was yeah. a whole other issue. And I, I told my mother I didn't want to move down there, but <laughs> we just yeah, get, we gave it a try. In summer, the rest of the year is great. But, and I loved growing up in Arizona because we had so many outdoor, I mean, everybody that grows up there, you're either riding horses on the weekend, you're four-wheel driving somewhere, you're riding tubes down the river, you're water skiing, you're snow skiing because there's snow, great snow skiing mountains like three hours from, you know, downtown Phoenix. And it's a, it's a great state. It's a lot like Colorado. It's, it's just very outdoorsy and, you know, hunting and fishing and sports and it's just uh, it was a great place to grow up. Yeah, I tried to get to the Arrowhead Mall on foot, and there was all this traffic. So I crossed the Grand Canyon, and I fell off of a, I fell off of a, a rock, and I, I fractured my kneecap. <laughs> oh gosh! I have, yeah, that sounds painful. <laughs> it was, it was. It healed in about a year and stuff. You know, I didn't need any medical attention or nothing. I could walk um, with it all fractured, but it was, it, it was painful. <laughs> I have to tell you. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, I got a couple injuries living in Arizona. I tell you. Um, Me too. I think I've <laughs> I think I've actually broken everything on my left side. For some reason, I fall to the left. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've broken almost everything on my left side from horse stuff. I mean, you know, just one thing after another, and. I'm I'm kind of done. Uh, hopefully, I'm done with all that. <laughs> I mean, I'm still riding horses. I'm still actually I'm team roping now, but I just really try to be careful. <laughs> yeah, you got to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so after high school, you got an entry level job at Creative Artists in L.A. What, what did you do there? Oh, I actually started at the front desk, and it was. Um, it was just like the, one of those pivotal moments in your life where it changed my life forever. It was, I was just kind of like, I, okay, I'm in LA. I love it here. I, I, I decided quickly, I went out there for fashion school and it just was not my thing. I, I knew really quick that I, that was not the path for me. So, um, I, I wanted to stay in LA though. And I thought, well, I better get a job real quick. And, and I literally looked in the variety and found that job and interviewed and got it. And it was kind of like <clears throat> if you work at CAA, you could enter through the mail, you know, the agent trainee program through the mail room. They start you right at the bottom, just like at the front desk. Mm -hmm. Or you can just kind of luck out and interview for a job there. And it was, uh, it was incredible because I got to learn um, in the heyday of – CAA when Michael Ovitz and Ron Meyer were the most powerful men in Hollywood that yeah. were on the cover of Time Magazine. They they um, they were the business. I, I got to, you know, sit at a desk and watch and pay attention and learn what all the terms were and what packaging was and how the whole business kind of worked from, from an inside point of view. God, that's amazing. Did you... Did yeah, <laughs> Did you, so you, you, did you have the plan that you were going to act professionally, but that was what you did to kind of uh, get, get in the, the, uh, the door? Yeah, that's kind of the, the big conflict is I didn't mean to work in the business during the day because that's a full-time commitment is, 
you know, you're either on the business side of the desk or you're on the creative side, the other side of the desk. And, and I've always um, had that creative heart. I knew that's where, where I wanted to be, but, but it was also invaluable to learn how everything worked, you know, from, from the inside, from the business side. And, you know, I did well at CAA and they um, had, when uh, Jeff Katzenberg was, um, took over from Paramount over at Disney, mm. he was looking for an assistant and Ron um, Meyer and Michael Ovitz have recommended I go be and uh, meet him and interview for that job and I, I ended up getting that job and um, learned even more from an even bigger point of view of a studio head, you know, how, yeah. how films are made, how scripts are chosen, how, how things are, you know, produced and all of, the, you know, I tried to soak up as much as I could, but, but it's also a really painful situation to be in because you're, you're seeing it all happen, but your, your creative heart is kind of dying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you're, unless I think if, and that's when I was moonlighting at night with my band and no one, not a whole lot of people knew that my friends did, but not people at work, but i I formed a country band, and I sang at night with my band, but um, worked during the day at, at, in the film business. And but you, when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're, a little piece of your soul dies every day. So um, I remember so well having to make that choice. I interviewed, well, I auditioned for a film, and ended up getting the lead in it. it well. <laughs> <laughs> it's Slaughterhouse Rock. <laughs> and I had to go into Jeff Katzenberg and give notice, and it was it was a tough decision because I knew I was leaving to go pursue my dream as an actor and, and, and further my country music career, but it was really tough to leave that job because Jeffrey had told me at one point, he said, you're doing really well here. You know, you can, you can definitely... I can see you moving forward to produce someday if that's what you think you want to do. And, you know, that's how do you leave that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but I ended up leaving and it was, a, I cried the ugly cry. I was like so embarrassed. And <laughs> But he was gracious and I've kind of kept in touch once every, you know, so often. He knew I left and went off to Nashville and, and did some movies and I also, you know, had hit songs right away in Nashville and that was kind of a nice thing that he kept in touch with that yeah that's that's good though I mean do you think looking back you could you probably could have dodged a bullet somehow <laughs> exactly you never know you, you have the grand you know idea of what it could have been like um but at the same time it could have been like <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, it's all meant to be you know I I came here to Nashville, and um, now this was after I'd done Slaughterhouse and a couple other things, you know, some more acting stuff and everything, but yeah. there was a moment where, where I needed to make a choice and either, you know, be in Nashville for country music, for songwriting career, um, or not, and I chose to do that, and, you know, I got here, and, you know, the first two songs I ever wrote and got cut went to number one so i guess i kind of made the right decision <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the first movie it says that you're in is a, a favorite of mine cloak and dagger oh that was so much fun oh my gosh and you know what so many people that's sweet that you say that because yeah whenever um somebody brings that up or asks me about that you know they always say oh that's I love that movie that's one of my favorite movies growing up yeah so it was just a one of those special movies that and you know how lucky was I I got to be in a movie with with Henry Thomas right out of E.T. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and my scene was with him on top of it <laughs> Yeah, I, I talked to um, uh, this the screenwriter Karen Lee Hopkins. She plays a security, um, a, a secretary in the movie. No way. Yeah. No way. Yeah, and she had a she had a good memory of of being on that set too. Oh, I you know, as a kid wanting to break into acting, right? And mm -hmm. you know, I've, I had done a couple little things here and there, but. 
um, again, that was kind of like a connection through um, CAA and the, and the agents that I used to work for. The director, Richard Franklin, um, was a client there, and he knew there was very few people I would tell because you're not supposed to say, "Yeah, I really want to act," you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, he knew, and he said one day he actually he I babysat for him and his wife. Uh-oh. They were a just wonderful couple from Australia, and he had done some big movies. He did Psycho Two right after um, right. Cloak and Dagger, and he he was just a, such. A, they were such a great family. So I would babysit their kids, and that's how I ended up telling him, "Yeah, I have aspirations." And so he was kind enough to say, "Well, you know, I'm doing Cloak and Dagger next. If you want to come audition, I can set up an audition for you for one of." The small parts that could get you into SAG, and but you have to, you know, you have to do okay and get the part. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes! So you know, it was. I ended up. He booked an audition for me with Jackie Birch, who was amazing, and I was nervous as heck and went in and read for her the two lines that I had, and she just went, okay, you got it. He said, if you did good, you could have, you could have this part. You got it. <laughs> I was like, what? So. Um, you know, all of a sudden you're driving on to Universal. You've, you're being led to your trailer with your name on it, and people are doing your hair and your makeup and making sure your wardrobe's on, and and then you get led to a seat, a set, and um, there's Dabney Coleman, and there's Henry Thomas, and there's, you know, yeah. and you're just, it, it, it's a surreal moment in your life and and then knowing that this is the thing that you you that gets you into the club you know you get taft hartley into sag it's the big big hump that you try to get over and um and then comes your time and the cameras are all on you and the the director goes and everybody you know 100 people on the set and this is a huge studio picture and they go okay are you ready Tammy? you know action and you just hope that you just don't die on the spot (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that you deliver your line and um, thank God somehow I did it and he said and cut and he looked at the crew and he looked back at me and he goes well what do I do with perfection let's move on <laughs> and that was it <laughs> <laughs> so I think Henry Thomas um, mm-hmm. kind of like high fived me we didn't fist bump back then it was just a little slap a little high five and that was it. That was my enter entry into the big time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I met him two, uh, three years ago, just before quarantine, um, at a horror con, and I brought no. my I brought my cloak and dagger VHS. It's still in good condition, no. and he signed it. Yeah. Oh, I hope I run into him someday. That would be a kick in the pants because that was uh, our little scene is together. You know, it's just. Yeah. That's just such a, but it was fun in between, you know, shots where you're, you're actually on set for a few hours, you know, mm-hmm. even when you just have one line or two lines. And I loved playing with the kids. Like I was with Henry and um, Christina, the little girl, yeah. the long girl, I can't remember her name. Christina uh, Nigra. But yes, she was a doll. And yeah. then um, Dabney Coleman was uh, uh, hysterical. You yeah. know, he was just a cut up on set all day long. It was just, it was really fun, but I liked hanging out with the kids, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome. And then um, you were a tour guide in Pretty Smart, which was uh, Patricia Arquette's, I think, mm-hmm. first movie. It was what? Yeah. I think that was her first movie. Yeah. That was um, that was a um, s- such an incredible experience because um, we... <sighs> We got to, you know, film that in Greece, in Athens. So we were there, I think, almost two months. And um, it was kind of funny because getting that part and getting on a plane to go over there, um, I think there was myself and one of my best friend, maybe my best, best friend in the whole wide world, is um, to this day, I met on the plane going over to that movie. She was... She and I were the two mid twenty year olds, and the rest of them were seventeen and sixteen on the on the plane to go over there. Yeah. So we felt like the mama hens, and <laughs> um, but we landed in Greece, and we 
we were staying at this beautiful hotel in um, Athens called the Grand Britannia, and we shot and got to hop islands, and oh my goodness, it was just the best experience ever, and we made lifelong friends on that movie. <laughs> yes, including the director, who would next direct you at Slaughterhouse Rock, and he, exactly. did he like you? Did he like you on Pretty Smart and said, I'm going to cast you as one of the leads in this movie? He well, yeah, he invited me to come in and audition. <laughs> but um, it was funny because I remember I had to audition. Um, you know, the friends we made, uh, I made on Pretty Smart, it was it was all a bunch of girls' first movie. It was Patricia Arquette and Jolie Fisher and mm -hmm. and um, Trisha Fisher and, you know, these amazing young actresses that went on. I mean, like Patricia won an Oscar, for God's sakes. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, it was it was just so much fun and and so on the next movie you know directors and pe people tend to work with their, their friends and people they know and so when I got called in to read for that <clears throat> it was you know it's up against your friends I was reading I, I think it came right down to me and Trisha Fisher for the part of Jan and so and I think he decided between because he had cast Trisha in the uh, pretty smart he went ahead and cast me in this one in slaughterhouse rock so but it was great because when it was done they all came to the um screening premiere and and we all sat together and you know it was just t t still to this day you know lifelong friends from way back then because it was just such a great experience it's one thing to work on a movie but to get on a plane and go to a foreign country and and then on top of it you're all just young girls kind of clinging to each other it's it was it was just a blast. Such a great time. Yeah. Are you a horror fan? Oh gosh, yeah. I I used to go to all the movies and I would always see all the horror films too cuz I love scary movies. It's just it's just fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, back when I was working with CA and Jeffrey Katzberg, we I saw every movie that opened every weekend. So I was I was never I never didn't see anything, but um, but I'm a, I'm a horror fan for sure. I would, especially you know back then. At that time, it was like when you know Friday the Thirteenth and all the Nightmare on Elm Streets were just getting popular, and that was such a big deal with all my friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Halloween, holy cow, Halloween! I was in high school. And I went with my two girlfriends, and we sat in the, all across the front seat of the Pontiac at a drive-in and saw that movie together. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about the perfect picture of a horror film beginning. There's three girls going to see Halloween in an old Pontiac on Halloween night in, you know, at a drive-in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What, what I like about this movie is that it has a Freddy Krueger vibe to it, you know, in terms of supernatural horror. Yeah, right, exactly. And I know um, it's that, it's that, yeah, what's reality and what's not, and, and you know, when you're, you know, floating off a of bed and, and dreams and all that stuff. That was just such a great genre of, you know, cool stuff to be done. And then... Um, Dimitri went for like has this cool little humor twist in it as well, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm from San Francisco, so like you know, I I love anything that has to do with Alcatraz. Like, what was it like shooting over there? It was crazy, and we only got to do that for just a, a short time. I think you know one night, but huh. um, it was crazy. It was it was interesting to get to go there and. And just walk that, you know, it's it's definitely as spooky as you think it's going to be, you know. I mean, it just looks like it does on the film. And and it's, um, you know, you, you start to play tricks with your head of, like, what has gone on here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember thinking, don't leave me. You know, we were all kind of clinging to each other, holding hands, walking through stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I took a tour of Alcatraz when I was in high school, and uh, there was cement in all the toilets in the um, jail cells. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just so creepy. It's just so, you know, hard and cold, and 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 then of course, you know, we were shooting, and I think it was February, January, end of January, beginning of February. It was freezing cold. It was always, 
you know, misting cold, if not raining. And I remember um, all of us at one point got, got like, really sick, like flu, you know, for a, a day or two. So we were, like, dropping like flies. Oh, we can't shoot him today. He's got to, you know, okay, he'll be better by Tuesday. So let's do her scene now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do, do you know what the budget was on the movie? Because it just, it seems like it was just well-produced, you know, even though it was a low-budget movie. Yeah, I want to say, um, I I can't be positive, but I think it was like a million two. Million two. Somewhere in there. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah, because it was almost you like... You probably call me and, and say, what the heck? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like a Spielberg-esque adventure, you know, in, in, a, in a horror yeah. world, you know? And it's cool, if you ever see those, um, do you ever watch those uh, things on Netflix, I think it's called, The Movies That Made Us? I've, I've heard about it, I haven't seen it yet. Oh, you've got to see them, they're so good. But the ones, um, the one about Spielberg and how he um, started with his little group of friends, it's just kind of like like that. And what, what you do on a low budget film is you just sort of like, wing it any way you can with the money you've got and um boy he was he was great at what he did <laughs> <laughs> i'll definitely check that out yeah that sounds like something i'd be into they're really really good yeah <laughs> what what was tony basil like to work with she was you know she's a, she's an icon she was definitely a diva she was yes. super nice but um you know she marched on set with her entourage and she was very in charge and yeah she was all about business and she got the job done <laughs> I, and it was it, she was kind of we were all in awe of her it was just it was just really cool she was she was great it was it was just like um um the queen is here <laughs> exactly. I had a bad experience trying to get her on the podcast two years ago. A uh, mutual friend put us in touch, and it was not a pleasant um, uh, private phone conversation. She was just yelling at me, and I was crying. No, why? Oh, my gosh. Why would she yell at you? I don't know. I just, I guess it was a bad time to call her or something. I don't know what it was, but I was just oh, like, wow. I was like, screw this. I, I, don't, I don't need this. As much as I love her work, I was like... I, yeah. I I was upset. This this happened two days after um, a tragic thing happened in my family too. So it just wasn't good timing. Oh, yeah. That sucks. And if it makes you feel any better, um, when I was working at was it CA or Jeffrey's office? I think mm. it might have been Jeffrey's office in, at Disney. I picked up um, a, a, a weird little private line rang at my desk. Yeah. And I picked it up and I said hello because it, it wasn't you know, the, the office line. So I said, hello, this is Tammy. And it was Barbara Streisand. And she said, oh. she didn't even stop to say hello. <laughs> she just said, she just launched into screaming at me. And, and then she found out it was the wrong number and the wrong person she had on the phone, but it was hysteric. So if that makes you feel any better, I've had Barbara, Barbara Streisand chew me out. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. I mean, it, it taught me a valuable lesson, Tammy. And that is, People in this business don't know their friends like they think they do, and it just it yeah. just it, it turned me off to the point where like now like people say, oh, you should talk to uh, my friend so and so, you know, if you like his or her work, and I'm like, no, thanks, I'll pass. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no, I can see that happening with her, especially if it was just like not the right moment at the right time. I'm, she strikes me as things have to be set up. Perfectly, right. they have to go the way they're supposed to go, and that's it. And she's going to get in and out and grace you with her Tony Basilness. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to accommodate her script. I'm not going to do that. How was How was working with Donna Denton? Didn't she die? Uh, uh, you mean in the movie? And no, in real life, did, uh, I, it was, it was like an internet rumor or something. I did not know. I have not heard that. I know I have to look that up. Okay. I, actually, um, she was lovely. She's just a beautiful, kind um, person. Uh, very elegant. Very elegant and very ladylike and very, um, yeah, she was lovely. I loved Donna. But I, I didn't, 
there wasn't, um, I kept in touch with, I made lifelong friends on Slaughterhouse Rock for sure. One of my, you know, my best guy friend in the world is Ty Miller and um, Steve Smith. He, we, he's a comedian that was, was, um, played, played, um, uh, what was his character name in that now? I forgot. But anyway, we, we all like hung like bandits for years afterwards, but, um, I didn't keep in touch regularly with Donna or Hope or Tommy. Uh-huh. Um, Nick Solosi, we, we kept in touch. In fact, somebody just told me hi from him about three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no, don't quote, don't quote me on that. I thought that was just maybe an internet rumor that she passed or something. Yeah, interesting. Well, I'm going to look, I'm going to look. I'm gonna look her up and see. I hope not. I sincerely hope not. It's it's Stephen Smith. He played Jack in the movie. Jack. Oh, why did that slip my mind? My gosh! <laughs> I had to scream his name out a hundred times. <laughs> Jack. I, Jack. I read. <laughs> I, I read on IMDb, and we know how inaccurate IMDb can be. Said that Larry Wilcox dropped out of the movie. Oh, you know what? He that kind of reminds me that that might have happened. Okay. I think I remember something about that. Maybe he was going to play Tommy. Tommy's part. Yeah. Maybe. He seems. So. He seems like he would. He would have been great at playing the villain. Yeah. You yeah, know? that's what I was thinking. Uh, I think I remember something about that. You never know. I mean, there were so many things. I, I've talked to people who I've, I've talked to people who worked with him on chips. They said, "Yeah, he was a villain." <laughs> mm-hmm. Him and Eric Estrada, they they were arguing like all the time. <laughs> well, that's that, that's probably true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I mean, I wasn't involved in a whole lot of the other part of the casting of that movie other than you got the part <laughs> you had some you had some great lines in the movie hey weren't you in my deviant behavior class <laughs> I know isn't that funny I mean I was kind of snarky I like Jan Squire she was kind of snarky and she's definitely you know in for Slaughterhouse Rock too yeah putting that out there <laughs> I could be like um, oh wait you know what I could be like Jamie Lee Curtis is right now at her age with Halloween you know I could be the old lady that's starting to get gray hair yeah. that comes back and kills him again <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or do a convention appearance, you know, once in a while. Have you have you been ever been invited to do a horror con? No, it, no, I would love to. That'd be super fun. Yeah, oh, horror conventions are fun. I mean, they can be, you know, um, difficult at times, but they're they're a lot of fun, you know. But I mean, people who do them love meeting the fans. That would be super fun. I think. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's there's nothing like I just really enjoyed working on Slaughterhouse Rock. It was it was just <clears throat> again one of the best times in my life, and it was just a fun. Um, you know, you always wonder what it's like to to have to be on set and you know really for better la- word for lack of better word pretend all these terrible things are happening to you. And it's, it's interesting. It's a, it's a whole interesting thing to dive into and have that, you know, kind of experience and, and then, you know, pull out of it and be just cracking each other up and punking each other behind the scenes the whole time laughing. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, but it's, but it's, it's such a cool experience. Plus it's like, you know, you're, you're all of a sudden in this world of night shoots. It's a lot of night shoots and, and, you know, it just makes you feel like you're in your own little world with your own little family of creative people on this, you know, cool movie for a while. Yeah. yeah I, so I noticed you've done songs for movie soundtracks, particularly uh, Disney ones. Was the uh, Jeff Katzenberg connection there for you to do those? No, actually, I, um, when my songwriting career sort of started to take off here, I was signed to Sony and um, Sony Publishing, and, and they had a TV and film sync department, so they would just, you know, um, take whatever brand new songs I would turn in, and they would run them to whoever was looking for whatever sync, and I got lucky with um, a few of them, but like the, yeah, like the, um, oh, 
what do you call it? Um, there was Runaway Bride. There was uh, Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen. Confessions was through Sony, and Runaway Bride was an interesting one because um, <laughs> it was such a big deal for me. And that song I had written <clears throat> and didn't even mean to. I had taken it to Martina McBride's producer because mm. he was a mentor and friend of mine, so I didn't even turn it in yet. I took it to him, the demo, and he said, wait, I'm here with Martina cutting right now and come come by the studio. So I handed it to, to him and her, and I didn't mean for it to go to her. It wasn't her kind of song at the time. It was, it was, it was not even remotely, I, I wouldn't have even pitched it to her. But she, she grabbed it, and she said, Tammy, you want to listen to this? And she took it home. Uh, to her family and her, she said the whole weekend her little girls could not stop dancing to that song. Aww. So she ended up cutting it, and the the her her cut of it, they ended up running it to um, Gary Marshall of uh, who was looking for the song for for the scene in Runaway Bride where Richard Gere and, and Julie Roberts are doing their little love montage where she's playing cards and they're in the rope swing and the whole thing. And he was looking for the, the song for that spot. And um, Sony pitched it to them and he fell in love with it. I'm, and the weirdest, here's a good story for you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> he, Gary Marshall, so I worked for Jeffrey and Jeffrey, I had left them, um, I had left Disney, Je you know, Jeffrey over there just before they got this, the next movie that they started working on after I left was, was Pretty Woman. Mm -hmm. So I left the office and moved to Nashville and did that whole thing and, and, and um, worked on movies and stuff. But they started working on the script and, and putting together Pretty Woman in pre-production and everything. And at that, and at that um, conference table in those m meetings and, and when Gary Marshall was coming up to our office a lot, I would have been there for those. And I was thinking, gosh, I, I just missed working on Pretty Woman with Jeffrey over there. And, uh, uh, uh. Well, come full circle, and a f just a few years later, I'm in Nashville. And basically, Gary Marshall called Runaway Bride, the sequel to Pretty Woman, and ended up using my song for the song that he wanted for that moment, and and that just made me go, okay, how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. so it was kind of like another little sign from God to me that you know you did you did good, you made the right choice. You know, you came here to to follow your music, and and you ended up having. A connection and working with Gary Marshall in a in a cool way that would have never happened if you'd not left that desk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's wonderful. It's a bizarre, you know, talk about you know small world. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what made you go into producing? Well, you know, when things things got really difficult for, I was you know. Um, a straight up hit songwriter signed to Sony for nine years and mm -hmm. so you, you're making your living just solely writing songs for years and years here and then you know streaming started happening and downloading and it all started with Napster and it became very difficult for um, straight up hit songwriters to make a living here in Nashville the money just the money just dried up for songwriters because um, when you can't you know, when publishing companies can't get paid to uh, for their songs, then they can't pay their writers to write the songs. And the, the writers, we were like the canaries in the coal mines that died first in the whole streaming thing. So a lot of songwriters fell, you know, I mean, it was very, it's, it's, it's a very tragic story because your biggest, biggest, biggest songwriters that you, um, that have written, some of the hits that you'll that are classics that you you are you know the, the, the biggest biggest classic songs you've ever known or that are close to your heart there's a songwriter out there right now who had a, who had to get a job after writing those big giant massive hits that had to get a job at um, Costco you know greeting people at the door because that's just kind of the 
what happened to people in, in that were just hit songwriters, that were just songwriters that worked for publishing companies. It just, the money just ended up drying up. Mm -hmm. And so when that was starting to happen, I didn't want to be caught flat-footed. I'm always kind of trying to stay ahead of the big wave that's going to crash over you. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I went and looped back to my Hollywood roots and um, happened to connect with a friend that was just getting ready to, a director that, that I knew that was just getting ready to do a film out here in Nashville. And he called me and said, hey, I know you know, you know, this, this movie is going to be about country music and a, a storyline, and I know you know a lot of people, and what, to, you know, you know Nashville. Um, do you want to co-produce this with me? So I, I said, heck yes. <laughs> and I literally did, just started doing that and never looked back. I, I co-produced that movie. It was called Like a Country Song with um, Billy Ray Cyrus and Joel Smallbone and Boo Boo Stewart and Jennifer Taylor. And, mm. um, and we... You know, it was it was cool experience because one, I got to um, cut my teeth on producing a film, which is just a lot of hats and yeah. a lot of um, you know finding locations and you know finding vehicles to use and finding who to use for catering and getting trailers rented and getting uh, camera crews and you know I cut my teeth on the on the producing part of filmmaking, but also. It gave me the chance to um, write music for it, and the director let me produce the soundtrack for it as well. So I got to write, I got to write songs for it. I got to produce the soundtrack and handle that whole side of it. So I got to do the music part as well, and that's kind of been what I've been doing since. So um, after like a country song, I co-produced a couple other movies um, right after that, and a documentary, and and that led me to um, where I'm at right now, which is the end of uh, 2019, I, I wrote and created a whole, and produced a whole pilot for a TV series called Way Back in the Woods. Mm -hmm. And we shot the pilot and um, got it all done. And, you know, the pandemic hit, so we had to wait wait on it for about a year. And then um, we picked back up and ran the pilot through the, um, the film festivals just to get, you know, see what we had and see how it did and hopefully get some wins and and uh, that get, gives you a little bit more legs on it to go pitch it to Netflix and, and Amazon and that, that, you know, the streaming surfers, the platforms. And we ended up finishing up the season in 2021 with 10 um, award wins and we got into 16 festivals. And so now we're starting to pitch. <laughs> so we're going to go for a, a, t a deal for our TV series now. Oh, that's super! I love, I love that name, yeah. Smashville Entertainment. <laughs> oh, I know, right? Isn't yeah. that the best name ever? I, I could not believe, I could not believe that I got that name, that it was available, and I got it. I'm, I'm so grateful because, you know, we've been writing songs in Nashville forever. We always call it Smashville. All, all of us songwriters, even before the National Predators called it Smashville, yeah. we called it Smashville because. What are you doing? Hey, write a smash today. Yeah, you too. <laughs> you know, we're yeah. all trying to write smashes, but we all nicknamed it Smashville a long time ago. And so to me, it's just a whole cool meeting. So I did find out that the Nashville Predators have the copyright on Smashville Entertainment, Smashville, the sports copyright, and I have it for the entertainment side. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> so, are, you, are you doing any live music at this time? Um. I'm not at this moment, but I might be in the next few weeks. I've got a lot of like um, artists, songwriters that are ha that are I'm writing with right now. Um, a, a few, you know, just a few different songwriters here and there that I like to write with, and and I pull people in when I need a song written for. I'm writing the music for the show of Way Back in the Woods as we go. Like we've got a whole eight episode season, and there's scenes where certain songs need to be so I've been writing music for that so but um there's some of these artists are starting to do uh writers in the rounds and they're like hey Tammy do you want to come do a writers in the rounds with me and I'm like yeah I probably should I haven't done one in a while so <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome I'd love to have you back uh when you have a, a project coming out oh I definitely will I'm 
we're well here's I'll just put this out there. We're gonna we're gonna get our show picked up and as soon as I know which which streaming platform we're working with, I'll call you and we'll we'll talk about that and we'll we'll uh, keep you updated on when things are gonna be coming out. Awesome, awesome. I wanna thank you so much for helping me kick off Women in Horror Month today. And oh, thank you. Yes, and I, and I so sweet and I, I really love your story. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, and I hope someone does um, invite you to a con because they are a lot of fun, and I'm sure there's a lot of slaughter, yeah. Slaughterhouse Rock fans out there. <laughs> well, put a good word for me. <laughs> I will, I will. Well, you have yourself a great day, and please stay safe over there. I will. You too, over there, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, talk soon. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Well, there you have it. Tammy Heiler, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, she is the very definition of Southern hospitality. I loved talking to her today. What a great lady. We could have talked for hours. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.